Jesus meets unexpected people in unexpected places and offers unexpected life. That's what's going to happen for these folks going this summer. But it's not just for them. It's for us. Jesus meets unexpected people in unexpected places and offers unexpected life. We're in this series called Unexpected. And we've been reading and hearing about people whom Jesus met unexpectedly in unexpected places. And Jesus did unexpected work in their lives. We've talked about Nicodemus and Zacchaeus and Martha and Mary and the disciples. And we're going to look at another one this morning in John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, find a Bible. If you don't have your Bible, look at your phone or grab the Bible in front of you. And find John chapter 4. John is the fourth book in the New Testament. It's about three quarters of the way through the Bible. It's after Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you get to Acts, you've gone too far, so back up. John chapter 4. And I'm going to ask my friend Iris Fujikawa to come and read this passage for us. But while you're finding John chapter 4 in your Bibles, let me tell you a story of how God met me unexpectedly one time. I was about the, the age of those that we just prayed for. I was in college, and I had decided to go to one of those college-aged, ministry-oriented events, you know, where they sort of rah-rah uh, Jesus and, and ask you to commit to deeper things. And I was there for fun, not for God. And it was at one of those, it was in, the, you know, one of those nice hotels, and so we met in one of those big, nice hotel uh, conference rooms. And because we were young, there were no chairs, so we were all sitting on the floor. And, and God spoke to me in the worst sermon I've ever heard. Seriously, it gives me hope as a preacher. <laughs> the worst sermon ever heard. I, I, was, I was sitting there, and this person begins to talk. And it's more like a lecture that's read from a script, and it's read poorly, and it wasn't worth reading to begin with, right? And so I laid down on the floor to take a nap, just praying, God, make this fast so I can get out to the pool. And in that moment of complete disinterest, God spoke to me in a dramatic, life-changing way. He spoke internally and redirected the course of my life. Act specifically, it was at that moment when he challenged me to give my life to serve his church. And it was unexpected. I was not prepared. So I ask you, are you ready? Are you aware? Are you alert? Let me just tell you, Jesus speaks to unexpected people in unexpected ways, and he offers them unexpected grace, unexpected gifts, unexpected life. Let's open our hearts to him this morning. Let's read together about one of these unexpected encounters with Jesus. Iris is going to read from chapter 4 of John, and out of respect for God's word, would you stand with me? All right, Iris, go for it. Starting in verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Jumping down to verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Thanks, Iris. You may be seated. I love that verse 4 says, now he had to go through Samaria. Uh, In what sense did Jesus have to go through Samaria? We know that it wasn't geographical, a geographical necessity, because Jews avoided Samaria. Between Jerusalem and Galilee, Samaria was the shortcut, but Jews always, almost always went out of their way to avoid Samaria because of the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. So when it says he had to, it wasn't because it was a geographical necessity. Uh, Neither was it because Jesus was in a hurry, because we learn later, as Iris read, that he spent two days there unexpectedly. They weren't on his itinerary. He just, because of the the response of the people, he spent two extra days there. So it wasn't that Jesus was in a hurry and he took the Samaritan route as a shortcut. Why does the text say he had to go through Samaria? I think it's because led by the Spirit, Jesus had an unexpected encounter waiting for him. And we discover at this well, the well of Jacob, which I have duplicated. This is the actual well from uh, Samaria. I went and got it and brought it here this morning for you. Just so you know, if you want to take it home with you, you're welcome to do that. So they, they come, Jesus comes and he's tired and he sits at the well and, and a woman shows up. Now, uh, verse 9 makes, I mean, it's just, we don't get this from our cultural vantage point Uh, her response to Jesus Jesus asked her for a drink and her response we should read her response like she's responding in shock she's in shock that Jesus a man a Jewish man a respectable 
respectable Jewish man would ask her, a Samaritan woman of questionable reputation, for a drink. I mean, we have to understand the dynamics here. Everything about this encounter is unexpected. Everything. For one, I mean, there's a little parenthetical statement that Jews and Samaritans don't associate. That is the understatement of the entire text. Not only did they not associate, they couldn't stand each other. They wouldn't talk to each other. They had no relationships with each other. Jews, it's interesting that, that, Jesus, that the text tells us very clearly that Jesus didn't have anything to drink with and that, and that she's shocked that she would have to give him a drink from supposedly her bucket or her drinking utensil, utensil because Jews would not drink from, from a cup that a Samaritan had used. And, and it, was, it would have been scandalous for a, for a man, especially a Jewish man, to receive help, especially help from a, a drink from, a, from a, the, the vessel of a woman. I mean, Jew, now, some of us have grown up in the church, and we know Jesus. We know that Jesus is fine. Jesus loves to step across these cultural barriers. But, we, but I just want you to get a sense of what's going on for this woman, for, for this woman, this is completely unexpected. I mean, she's the wrong race, the wrong gender, the wrong religion, the wrong lifestyle. Everything is wrong with this encounter. It, really, what should have happened is that while Jesus was resting on the well, culturally, and he looked and he saw a woman coming at the well, culturally, it would have been expected that Jesus would have gotten up and walked away from the well so that she could get her water without having any fear of interaction with him. And yet, what does Jesus do? Jesus moves toward her, and he begins a conversation with her, and he asks her for help. Do you see how unexpected all this is? And what time of day is it? Anybody pick that up at the end of verse 6? Look, at, look again at your text. What, what time of day? Noon, middle of the day. Don't miss that. It's important. Just as a few weeks ago, Dave presented the unexpected encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus. You remember what time of day that Nicodemus encountered Jesus? It was nighttime, right? Nick at night. So this is Naomi at noon. It's noontime. Now what's significant about that? Well, if you read the scholars, they tell us that women went to get water either early in the morning or late in the evening when it was cool. And they almost always traveled in groups, both for safety and for social engagement. Naomi is here. Middle of the day, in the heat, and she's alone. And later in the text, we learn a little bit about her. And if we start to put the pieces together, and I, I know that I'm, I'm making some assumptions here that aren't in the text, but, but I, think we can, I think we can accurately say that the fact that she was there alone at noon, and that Jesus has this, Jesus reveals to her her own relational difficulties, her own relational situation, I think we see here a woman who is probably an outcast. She's out here in the middle of the heat at the well all alone. Now, why is she alone? Well, there's a little bit of a hint when Jesus asks her about her husband and she says, you know, I don't have a husband. And he says, you've had five. And the man you're with now is not your husband. Now, again, let's step back into the first century. Because we read that from our 21st century culture. And we read, huh, well, she gets around, doesn't she? This is a woman that moves from man to man. Maybe she just can't commit. But... This is first century ancient Near Eastern culture. Women had very little relational freedom. 
Men had all the power. Women could not divorce. Only men could divorce. Only men had that power. And so I know, I know the text doesn't give us the whole story here. But, but as I interpret it, as I read it, I read of a woman who has been rejected by five husbands. And, and the one that she's living with now won't even adopt her as a wife, won't even call her wife. Maybe she's just living in an abusive relationship with a man who's simply using her. Like I said, we, we don't know everything. Why would five men have rejected her? Again, in that culture, one of the w- reasons women were rejected is they couldn't produce an heir. They couldn't produce a child. Maybe she was unable to produce a child. Maybe a husband had died or more than one had died. Maybe she simply had the reputation of a woman who could be used and abused over and over again. And so she lived into that reputation. I think it's important for us to see here a woman alone at the well in the middle of the day in pain. I think we see a woman here that is lonely that has experienced rejection after rejection. And in, in, in town, in town, which is a distance from the well, in town she experiences the scorn and the rolling eyes of everybody because of her reputation. And she's a woman who's trapped in her shame. I mean, she's, she's at the well and she's alone but she hates it. She hates that she has to come to the well in the middle of the day. Do you have a place like this? And maybe it's not a physical place. Maybe it's an emotional place. What is your well? What is the place where you find yourself alone? in pain. Maybe it's nothing you've done. Maybe it wasn't your fault. But somehow life has brought you to a place where you are in just agonizing, life-crippling pain inwardly. Maybe it's due to loneliness, rejection, shame, and, or maybe you do believe you brought it on yourself. Maybe it is something you've done. Through choices that you've made, you find yourself at the end of your rope. You find yourself in a place of desperation that you never, never would have believed that you would find yourself. The fact that, that you look at your life today and you think, how did I get here? What, what am I doing here? And whether it was of our own doing or whether it was not of our doing, I think many of us find ourselves at, at places like this. And we don't, we don't like to think about it. We don't like to talk about it. Maybe people around the, in the room around us don't even know about it. But we're here. And we, and we like her, we come day after day, and we come to this well, this place, and we find here every day exactly what she found every day, and that is a temporary quenching of our thirst, because we're not, we're not aware that there's something deeper. Maybe we, maybe we show up every day, and, and, we, and we begin to try to mask that pain, or we, or we try to hide it. And I, I know some of the ways that we hide or we try to feed that pain. We try to mask that pain. And they're all temporary. We, we know that. Whether, whether it's through food or sex 
or spending or through some fantasy world of books or screen. We attempt to, to quench the thirst, to mask the pain. And, and if we stop and think about it, we know, like she knew, that this water is only temporary. We know it's only a temporary masking. But we find ourselves at a well, a well of pain, of desperation. Maybe for you it's a place of insecurity. Or, um, maybe you just find that there's, there, there's an area in your life where you just, you just um, feel inadequate. I am a professor. Some of you know that. My business card says professor, but it doesn't have the right initials on the business card. And it doesn't have the initials that most of my colleagues have that have research degrees. And so I feel that inadequacy every time my name is on a list with everybody else and the initials next to their name. I find my well of inadequacy at my workplace. I, uh, you maybe have heard the phrase, the expectation of professors to publish or perish. Um, I'm inadequate there as well. I, every week an email goes out from the university listing everyone's book, books, articles, any professional or academic publications or presentations that have been made that week, and I just delete it immediately every week. My office sits between a biblical scholar who has written several commentaries and a theologian who writes what feels like a book a week. I think it's more like a book a year, which is still amazing, but it feels like a book a week. I confront my inadequacy every day when I walk into my office, in every hallway, in every coffee break with my colleagues, around every lunch table. I feel inadequate. But Jesus meets me there. Jesus meets me at my inadequacy. He comes to me at my well and he says, if I, if I will push the pause button on my own self-doubt long enough, he meets me and he says, Kent, I have you where I need you. I have you right where I can use you. This is where I put you. I am enough, Jesus says, if I listen. He says, I've given you everything you need. Stop depending on the approval of other people. Stop trying to be a people pleaser. I am all you need. And Jesus will meet you at your well. He will. Trust me. He will. Whatever that pain is, whatever that sense of inadequacy or loneliness or shame, whatever it is that's down in there that eats at you, that Satan continuously brings to your attention. And oh, he will, friends. You know that. Our enemy loves to bring to our attention our inadequacies, our sin, our weaknesses, our shame, our loneliness. Day after day after day. And friends, today, today I'm here to say that Jesus meets you there. Jesus will meet you at your deepest place of pain. And he provides for you what he provided, what he offered to her. He says, those who drink the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Let me interpret this. Jesus is saying, I am enough. I will provide all that you need. What I provide is eternal. It can never evaporate. It can never 
dissipate. The life that I give you is eternal. And it's rooted in a never-ending flow of God's grace. It comes from God himself. If we will stop and listen and open our lives to Jesus, he will penetrate to the deepest places of our pain. I mean, the, the, the scriptures are full of, of, of the, this imagery of, of the water of God refreshing. Listen to Isaiah chapter 41. The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. What I'm describing in my own life and in your life is the poor and needy. We are poor and needy. The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. This is what Jesus does. This is what he offers us. Isaiah 55, and we sang this song. I, I asked Heidi to sing it. It was, it's, it was going through my mind all month as I was thinking about this. Isaiah 55, come all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. This is the invitation. Jesus says, I am all you need. Let me fill you. Let me heal you. Heal you. Let me provide what you need. And then just a few chapters after this encounter with, with uh, this woman, jo Jesus says in John chapter 7, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water, will flow from within them. By this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So Jesus, by his Spirit, fills us at our places of deepest longing and pain. Can you experience that? Will you receive that? Now look, it's not comfortable always. It wasn't comfortable for her to start, for Jesus to start pointing out her areas of embarrassment and shame. But for Jesus to fill us, we have to be willing to lay ourselves open to him. To say, this is who I am. This is where I'm inadequate. This is where I'm lost. This is where I find my shame and my pain. And if we lay ourselves open to Jesus in that way, he promises to fill. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus wants to fill you this morning. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to invite him to fill us. For the next several minutes, we're just going to pray. I'm just going to let you do business with Jesus right where you are. You may sit, you may kneel, you may stand you may come up here, whatever you would like. I'm going to invite the, the worship team to come and prepare because I want them to sing one more time that song from Isaiah 51. But before they sing, I'm just going to give us a couple of minutes to do business with Jesus, to let Jesus meet us at our well like he met her at her well. What is your place? What is your well of pain, of loneliness, of shame, inadequacy? Let Jesus meet us there now.